Hi, I'm Patrick Miller, uh, CEO of Ampere Industrial Security, and I'm here with my good friend Earl Shockley, CEO of Empowered. And we are going to talk about the NERC SIP standards. And why? Because the NERC SIP standards turn 20 years old this year. And it, they're almost old enough to buy a drink. <laughs> so 20 years ago, uh, the first iteration of what would become the SIP standards uh, was the little FERC document that got floated around. Started this big conversation that ultimately ended up basically just transforming the entire North American electric sector cybersecurity landscape, right? Before it, there was really nothing. I mean, nothing is that it was really just, it was voluntary, it was entirely up to you. You could do pretty much whatever you wanted to do from a security standpoint that you thought was right or, or not. So this was the first for us to actually get all of the utilities aligned and say, okay, this is the minimum bar that you're all going to have to meet for security, at least by right, securities of a certain size and, 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 and function. This started way, way back in 2001. And you know, it's been, it's been a long ride, but this actually completely transformed the North American electric sector security landscape, right? It's been so momentous and it's done so much all around the world. I wanted to have a chat with Earl Shockley and uh, talk about this because both of us were in this early, early in the day. I take myself back 20 years ago. I was a basically a, a SCADA security guy at a utility and they were saying, hey, there's these new things coming out that look like SCADA security. So why don't you go check it out? We took a look at this FERC document. And of course, this all happened right around the terrorist attack and many other things were going on at the time. But we you know, thought this was, this was going to be a big deal. And, and it certainly turned out to be a big deal 20 years later. Over that span, I uh, left the utility, went to become the first SIP regulator. I was the first SIP auditor in the country under the Western region, WAC. Uh, we did that, helped write some of the original language in the standard. And then to this day, as a consultant, I'm still you know, doing security, the guidance for the security working groups and stuff for the standards. And, and Earl, of course, you're also a CEO of a consulting firm for the ONP side. But 20 years ago, where were you and what were you doing when all this came out? Yeah, I was in system operations at the time at Tennessee Valley Authority. I just got off a series of night shifts uh, when my wife woke me up and she said, hey, our country's under attack. So really for me, the catalyst to security was 9-11, uh, that awareness that, you know, 9-11 that 9 brought us, right, that uh, physical security really stepped up around our critical facilities. We immediately... Um, started securing our control centers and blocking off streets and having concrete barriers around, you know, all of our facilities. We really, you know, did not understand whether we would be attacked or not at that time. So there was, you know, high alert and, and we really moved forward with securing everything that we, we knew to secure at the time, right? And that basically led into the 2003 Northeast blackout where the regulatory rules shifted, right? And we had the urgent action standards. We had cybersecurity being discussed. We had the 2005 Power Act that formulated the ERO. Then we had the FERC orders 693 and 706 that rolled out the NERC reliability standards. Uh, before that, it was a voluntary policies that we were abiding by in the industry. And in 2003, it showed that our industry didn't have a good day. Um, so that's where I was 20 years ago. And I just remember one of our old mentor saying, um, you know, when I was on the desk, as a matter of fact, when the uh, 2003 blackout occurred and we separated from the Northeast part of the United States, uh, we had an old mentor there. And he says, you know what, uh, your life is going to change. I'm retiring soon, but, <laughs> you know, um, we're going to have federal regulation based on this. So, yeah. And, and there it was. And there it was. Uh, myself, I had just joined a uh, utility. I was at Pacific Corps and, uh, August, my first month in 2001, and then, of course, the September 11th terrorist attack happened, which was the, uh, for us, it, on the cyber side of things, it definitely uh, changed our world. <laughs> uh, we got lots of calls. Of course, we were the power provider for the upcoming Olympics in 2002. So in addition to all the other moving parts, we had, we had that on our plate. But yeah, I remember getting dragged into a, a meeting with the Critical Infrastructure Protection Advisory Group, or the CIPAG, CIPAG, whatever. And it was to, to discuss this thing called um, Appendix G of the FERC Standard Market Design. That was this thing coming out. And uh, we were wondering, OK, what, well, what is this? And well, so, you know, this is you know, part of an old presidential directive from 1998. So we kind of followed the chain back. And it was PDD 63 from the Clinton era that spawned this discussion about protecting infrastructures. September 11th terrorist attack. Wait, we better. We're going to use this as a vehicle. So it, it, 
it got things going and it was like a I want to say it was like 14 pages of, uh, of the appendix G was this little security appendix at the end of like an 800 page market design. Okay. Needless to say, all the, mar the market design didn't make it through, it, it failed. Um, and appendix G got pushed off a little bit. And then of course, as you mentioned, the blackout happened. Okay. I think everything kind of got dusted off again. And then we shortly after that, that was, it, was, it wasn't like completely forgotten about. It had been moving around behind the scenes. Okay. And then we all got uh, basically dragged back together, got the band back together. Uh, to create the urgent action standard in 2003 to the UAS 1200. So, yeah, for yeah for those playing the uh, the Jeopardy game at home, it actually does go back that far. I guess like the earliest earliest thing that would spawn into SIP was the this appendix G of the SMD. But it's interesting to to think it's been it's been that long, and we've had all of these things happen between then and now, right? So back then, I think you know, we were both at utilities. So, what did you think about this? For you, what do you think the hardest part about getting this thing off the ground was? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question because, you know, we came into the ERO around the same time. I was hired in about 2007, about four or five months before the standards became mandatory. So uh, one of the big lists was we had to establish uh, programs at NERC, compliance programs. We had to establish compliance auditors, which you were a part of the SIP side of that, you know, being one of the first SIP auditors that we had at the ERO. So we had to stand up programs that could be sustainable and could monitor the reliability standards and audit the reliability standards, right? So I think the hardest thing if we're focusing on SIP about getting the SIP standards off the ground was the question, would they succeed, right? I was excited that number one, the energy sector was addressing cyber and physical security. Uh, other sectors uh, in the energy world uh, hadn't done that quite yet. So to me, you know, we were breaking new ground. You know, we were uh, looking, as you know well, that we were looking for a control-based uh, approach to auditing the SIP standards. Uh, we felt that we were going to be setting the bar for other energy sectors. Um, but I also sensed a struggle at that time, right? Because um, really, what did the regulators want versus what the technical people in the industry want uh, versus what NERC uh, wanted? So when I mean the regulators first, I mean FERC, the upper levels of Department of Energy, so on and so forth. So they had an opinion of what it should look like. NERC had an opinion of what it should look like. Uh, the technical people in the industry, which you were a big part of as well, um, had a certain view of what it should look like. There was frameworks in place at the time, the NIST and SANS frameworks uh, in particular that I remember. And we had lots of discussions at the NERC level about whether we should create a new wheel or whether we should you know, adopt these, these frameworks. But discussion around that was these frameworks at the time did not include control systems. They were more corporate IT related. And I remember that moving forward with the SIP standards, it would have to be focused more on control systems and protecting our critical infrastructure in the energy sector. I also remember there was a lot of discussion around what was the ESI SAC at the time around its independence, right? So um, NERC being a regulator and being certified as the ERO, there was a lot of discussion as to whether that ISAC should be under that umbrella but it still fell within a regulatory structure and there was concern about independence there. Mm -hmm. So I think my overall opinion was I was excited. I think that we were doing something the other sectors wasn't doing. And I had high hopes for, for the SIP standards because I believed as I was part of the ERO in those days that we were there to make a difference. We were there to help put administrative controls in place. We were there to address the risks of the bulk electric system. So I really liked what, what, you know, that approach early on in the process. Yeah, you know, I agree. Um, I felt like we were moving the needle. This was going to set the bar. I mean, even at the utility, when I was writing this stuff, right, I hadn't become a regulator yet. Um, right. Even at the utility writing this stuff, I felt like, you know, hey, we're, we're making history here. We're, we're doing cool things. We're going to secure the, the grid. I had two key challenges. We, the, the utility that I was at, at least, was kind of built by merger and accretion over like 100 years. So I had nothing in common, and I had to try to figure out how to get all of this stuff to meet what was then, you know, the UAS 1200, the earliest part of the SIP standards. At the same time, I'm running up against my management, which is basically saying, oh, NERC's been voluntary forever. You know, this isn't going to be mandatory and enforceable. And I'm like, no, this, this is on the path to being a federal law. So it was a big challenge just to get the management to shift to you got to do this 
versus we should probably do this. You know, we were the power provider for the Olympics after the September 11th terrorist attacks. We at least got a, we had some sense of uh, motivation, needless to say, uh, to do some things. But when it came down to, you know, whether this was going to be law or not, they still didn't quite think it was going to happen. So I had to fight against that. It was a pretty strong headwind. Um, and then, of course, in the industry, we were, you know, if we're being asked to write our own future, I remember tons of infighting and discussions around, you know, do we go with something like a NIST or a SANS framework, right? Uh, because right. it's pretty IT centric. There wasn't a lot of OT or ICS specific frameworks at the time. We had ISA 99 and there was, a, I guess, arguably a little bit of that in the NEI 404 stuff. But it was, it was still, you know, like you said, you know, a rounder wheel. You know, we, we had to go off and invent our own special round wheel for the, the industry. And I think that was, at the time, probably what we needed. I'm not sure we would have, uh, you know, embraced anything else, honestly. But yeah, I think the hardest part for me was just getting the organization to admit that this was serious and that we had to do it and that it wasn't just a, a nice to have and can we just do the minimum and do we have to do it now? Can we do it later? Uh, there was a lot of, you know, getting that that kind of bat turning the battleship in the bathtub problem. So that was the hardest part. But I, you know, I would say by the time you made it to NERC and you saw the standards were now mandatory and enforceable, right? So like 2008 and beyond, we'd, we'd had orders 706 and 693 and, and we're looking at possibly even some interpretations and there's some machinery in place. And did you think it was going to succeed or did you, did you have your reservations? Um, I did think it was going to succeed. Um, you know, I did think it was going to make a difference. I thought that we would be identifying a baseline, right? I thought that we were going to kind of break down the barriers between what security looked like versus what compliance looked like, right? And I know that you were deeply involved being, you know, one of the first SIP auditors to conduct a SIP uh, audit on yeah. the uh, uh, energy sector. Uh, so I know that there was, um, you know, some angst about, you know, what that audit approach would be like. What was your thinking when you guys were formulating the audit approach to the SIP standards there? Yeah, gosh, there was a handful of us. Uh, myself, Roger Lampala, gosh, the early days we had like Jamie Sample and John Stanford and, oh gosh, even Tom Glock. But there were a few of us trying to figure out what this would look like. And we had everything on the spectrum from like, oh, remember the old readiness reviews, right? Where you just had Nurk and some peers and, and it was collaborative and it was, I think it was because there weren't real penalties involved. I mean, WEC had like the RMS violation, but it was kind of a voluntary penalty. Right, right. Um, but it seemed much more collaborative and there was a genuine drive and goal to make things better. Right. Uh, we, right. We, we tried that. Um, they said that wasn't going to work. So we came back and said, well, there's this thing called COVID and COSO. We could look at, you know, actual control objectives and controls and control testing. And that seemed to be foreign and um, undesirable at the time. So um, I think it was even Roger and I came back with the yellow book and said, OK, here here is something from the GAO. And if you're going to be kind of a quasi federal thing, if you, I, know, I know they're still at that time, they were a nonprofit, all that good stuff. But to get them to kind of embrace maybe something that was had some rigor to it that could, in, in theory, be measured, at least pick one of these. And they ended up picking the performance based one, which is my least favorite of, well, one of the least favorite out of all the options, because you get to generate a ton of evidence and it's not it's not designed really to test your controls is to just evaluate your evidence and, and hopefully some non-arbitrary and consistent manner, which of course we all know we didn't end up with that. But yeah, in our, in our early stage design, that was, that was kind of the goal. But I think, you know, when, even when you saw like the UAS 1200 come out and the earliest, you know, draft one of SIP, uh, it was very control center uh, focused. It, it had, you know, the words like generation and transmission in there, but it was still very control center focused. It, it took us a while to actually morph it to where I guess kind of beat it into shape, which I think is why you see so much flux in the standards is we're still trying to correct some of those early one size fits some approach that we took. And we didn't have like a generation specific standard or a transmission one or a special one for control center that felt more like IT uh, versus OT. I, I had my hopes that it would succeed because I wanted it to. Heck, I was the, you know, I was at WEC. We had the first SIP program in the country and I was the first SIP auditor that actually went out and did this stuff. So I, I had high hopes for it. Um, I think, I think there are high hopes in my perspective as well. Yeah, and I think it moved the needle then to transition from then to now, like fast forward to where we are now. We've gone through what, what version one, UAO 1200, 13. So we start with like the SMD 1200, 1300, version one through three. Version four gets drafted, gets, you know, it doesn't happen, just whacked at the knees. And then we got version five, which of course is a complete landscape shift for everybody. 
And then we start this regular churn, as I think I've heard even you say, is it like 50% of the standards are constantly in flux, which is that's kind absolutely, of, yeah, that's difficult. That's difficult to keep chasing. But uh, so we fast forward to now. And in today's world with today's threat landscape and today's modern utilities where we've got everything from, you know, DER and renewables and the grids kind of turning it in, itself inside out. Where do you think this is going to go? I mean, what do you, what do you think this, what, what's the future of NERC set? Wow. You see, that's a really good question because looking back on 20 years ago, and it's interesting to kind of discuss what we felt like back in the day, you know, when we were uh, building the programs and formulating. You know, one of the, the SIP industry mentors, uh, Mike Asante, said something to me uh, early on in my NERC career. He says, uh, when we were talking about particularly the SIP standards and where they're going to go, uh, he said his greatest fear was that uh, bureaucracy was the, the evil of, of, you know, what we were trying to do. Administrative would have been the evil because he discussed uh, pretty specifically that not only can you under control something, but you can over control something. Right. Yeah. And you can spend too much money and you can put too much in place and, and it really prevents you from hitting your security objectives. Right. One of your famous quotes is that, you know, if we are in a mode where we're promoting fear of the auditor more than fear of the attacker, yeah. you know, we're really not hitting the mark. Right. So so 20 years later uh, in the SIP standards going forward, um, when I left NERC in 2015 and formed the power one of my, my key uh, aspects to my mission was to uh, simplify the complexity because as I spent almost 10 years as a regulator and I was auditing and, and involved in many major investigations, I saw that the complexity was great. You know, once we formulated these standards and we put them in place, the prototypes really had a lot of bureaucracy to them. The, the evil of, like Mike Asante said, there was a lot of administrivia to it. So those are the things that disappoint me that we couldn't come to a control-based approach to auditing, uh, looking at performance and looking at, at folks protecting the infrastructure. Uh, at times, I feel that you, you spoke of the needle being moved. Um, I think the needle has swung so far that we pay more attention to compliance and the administrivia around compliance than we do security. Yeah. Um, and if you look at uh, the SIP standards, there's some charts out there on the enforcement side on the NERC webpage that shows uh, the top 10 standards that, that were violated. Most of those are low risk issues. So it's administrative issues that they're finding, right? Um, and to your point, at any given time, over 50% of the NERC standards are, are in flux. So what it does is it creates a constant churn of documentation for the, for the, the industry. And if you have smaller companies that, that don't have the budget to have very strong compliance uh, programs, basically they have one or two, maybe three compliance people, and they rely on the rest of the team to supplement that. But they wear many hats and, you know, and being able to address the, the complexity around it is very difficult. So if I, if I look at the program now, the level of bureaucracy disappoints me. The level of administrivia that the regulator is expecting on the industry and the money they expect them to spend to achieve levels of, of bureaucracy is disappointing. And that's really tough because uh, the level of security talent is challenged in our industry, right? I read a report just recently that for every gray haired technical guy like me that's leaving the industry, there's only one in the pipeline. And for the cybersecurity world, um, that's even more so because not only is the energy sector, sector fighting for this talent, the banking systems, the medical, all of the different sectors in the world are fighting for this talent. I'm definitely seeing that on the audit teams, the level of security talent is not there. And so there's a challenge for the, the, the industry in that they have auditors that have less experience than they do auditing them, right? So I think the other aspect, um, if I'm looking back 20 years, is I'm really disappointed that the ERO hasn't come up with some more effective metrics to show how effective the SIP standards and the program is, right? Uh, what can we look at? I mean, the ERO has been sitting on this data since 2007, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. How successful has the SIP program been? Um, historically and currently, uh, there are SIP standards. Uh, the most violated standards are in the top five, <laughs> always yeah. in the top yeah. five, right? So 
you know, we have to ask ourselves if the most sophisticated security programs are not meeting the mark historically or currently, then the ERO, the regulatory industry, in my opinion, must consider this. And, and we have to ask ourselves the question, are the regulators being accountable for helping the industry miss the target? Because we have this constant moving regulatory target. And you mentioned this, right? There is complexity for uh, the industry to move through before they can even pull the bow to get a shot. It is not a static target that they can just, you know, take aim at, right? They have to navigate all of this different stuff before they can even see the target. You know, with so many violations, you know, um, perhaps we should examine the quality of the requirement language, the ever-changing direction, the administrative complexity, the inconsistent audit approach. Uh, I'm with clients uh, auditing in all the different regions, and I see auditors with, with different pet peeves and different approaches. That puts a strain on the industry to make sure that they're trying to follow everything uh, everybody wants. So I think the question comes up, and you and I have talked about this before, uh, is it time to change directions? Because if I look back on SANS and NIST, where it was 20 years ago versus where it is, these frameworks have matured greatly. Yeah. And, and they, they include all of the aspects of controls, uh, particularly around controls and around security. So, and, and I think that, you know, just to sum this up, I think my, my biggest fear is that a cyber attack of great consequence on the U.S. power grid would shatter the ideal cybersecurity framework of private sector accountability, right? We have accountability. We're the guardians of this now. And I promise you that uh, the people in the industry take this seriously. And so we don't want them fearing the auditor more than we want them fearing security, right? We don't want them to take their uh, eye off uh, operations and reliability and security uh, so that they can make sure they're checking a box in the compliance world, right? Mm -hmm. So we really have to take accountability for maintaining security of the critical infrastructure. And I think the ERO and the regulatory world has to help us do that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all that. <laughs> um, and I, I see lots of messaging, um, not so covert. It's very overt messaging from FERC about, you know, there's gaps in the SIP standards and why isn't SIP more like NIST, especially this particular thing that we're looking at. And right. I get asked all the time is, you know, do we, do we need to continue with this NERC SIP stuff or is there something better? Um, and I think, I think honestly, at this point, I think it was good when we needed it and it was useful to do it that way to start. I think honestly, it's it, it could be collapsing under its own weight with respect to complexity, administrative burden, um, mm -hmm. and honestly, the CMEP, real, really. I mean, let's be honest, it's not just the standards themselves. I mean, they're they're, they're by no means perfect. And I, I'm, I'm at fault as much as anybody who started this thing because I helped break some of that stuff originally. Like I say, it got us across the finish line at the time. Um, but right. I think today we've got much better options. You know, the administrative burden component, as you mentioned, um, we could go to something like controls objectives and controls and control tests, and we're not having to produce mountains of performance evidence that then gets arbitrarily judged by, you know, whatever auditor and whatever level of experience they have or don't, um, and the degrees of inconsistency between the regions. And But I do think there's some better approaches that we could be looking at now. I mean, this is the most critical of all the critical infrastructures. And it's it, it does deserve, you know, I guess to have the right thing for it versus just what we've inherited. So I, I, I agree. I, and I would like to see, uh, you know, if there are metrics to be, to, to hold NERC accountable for, you know, I guess being a, a good steward or custodian of these standards, they should honestly right. have their feet held to the fire for success. I mean, this is really important stuff. You and I have seen that right. show the inside at the utility and the inside at the regulator, we've seen the entire, you know, package of sausage being made. And I definitely think we, we, we could get some, we, we, we deserve better. <laughs> I don't know how to put it any way better than that. Absolutely. And we've had 20 years to learn, right? Yeah, Because exactly. having been in the industry for 40 years, and as you know, if you go back 25, 30 years, when we were putting our infrastructure together, we weren't thinking about security. We weren't thinking about the Internet of Things and everything connecting together, right. right? So when we put these programs in place, not only did the industry have to adjust to the compliance aspect, but they had to learn how to secure um, aging uh, historical infrastructures that were in place, right? right? Instead of, you know, they didn't have the ability to kind of redesign and spend the money to do everything, right? They had to 
uh, protect what they had. So, yeah, I think the 20 year point is, is a good point for all of us to reflect back and say, what have we learned over the last 20 years? How effective um, have we been? What can we do to really step up the game? Because as you can see with the pipelines getting hacked and everybody having a, a you know, the cybersecurity fear as they should have had a long time ago, um, you know, it's starting to roll even more. Um, so we really should put our feet on the ground and, and look at the programs in place, or are we just going to continue to, to build the, the bureaucracy and the administrative? And are we going to continue to burden? And I really like the phrase you gave that, you know, allow the program to collapse upon itself. And, and that would be tragic in my opinion, right. if, if, if we're not learning and if we're not further developing, and if we don't have the courage to change direction when it's necessary, I think that's something that's really important. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's not that there's not a lot of great work going on. Those drafting teams, they spend their life in Absolutely. those drafting meetings to write stuff. And I, I appreciate what they're doing, but I do think that um, it's getting to a point to where, you know, this, this process of going through the ANSI accredited process to get everything approved and then get it voted down. I mean, as much as I would love the industry to have a little more charge of its own future, uh, I also think that that's, it's, it's hurting us as much as it's helping us. So uh, we Absolutely. probably start thinking about some options. You know, the legal aspect where they take the technical language and they have to convert it in a legalistic manner so that they can actually enforce it, right? right. So the attorneys have to have their point. And sometimes that's where the ambiguity comes from, right? And I understand that legal aspect where it starts with the applicability, the directive, and, mm -hmm. and what the evidence is in the language of the standards. But what it does sometimes is it takes away from the technical aspect and it, and it makes it more ambiguous than it, than it could be if we allowed them to be technical standards. Right. Yeah. And there's some good ones now that exist that we could we could borrow, uh, for example. So what do you think, you know, if 20 years later, let's like let's take a look at some of the accomplishments that NERCSIP has done, because I don't want to just, you know, say it was a terrible thing, because like I say, it was it was a great thing to move us at the time and we needed it. Um, so That's let's just look through like a, a greatest hits of some of the awesome things that NERCSIP NERC has done. And of course, you know, we'll just start out with a big shout out to Mike Asante for, you know, being a pioneer in all of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think number one, it's awareness, yeah. right? Cyber awareness is, is at an all time high in our industry. And that was like one of the things that excited me early on, right, is that uh, we were taking the leading edge in, in the energy sector about, you know, security, physical and cyber, right? Mm -hmm. So awareness uh, around cyber and physical security, I think, is, is at an all-time high for there. And, and there's definitely great aspects to the SIP standards in that, you know, uh, access management, you know, change management, patching, all of these things that, uh, you know, have really not been our forte over the years, right? So we're a lot better as an industry doing some of the key things that's required in the security world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we do have um, a leg up on, on these other industries that are just now thinking about what you know, we can do. Um, and as they start building their programs, I'm sure they're going to be looking at the SIP standards. They're going to be looking at the progress of, of those standards and how they were rolled out and whether they could easily adopt. And when you're in pressure situations like that, it's easier to adopt and build. So, you know, I think they're gonna be looking at that, but I really think that cyber awareness, just having a number of the key elements training in place to teach people what to look for, reporting, you know, just a simple thing of reporting, you know, up to the EISAC and, and you know, so that we understand what's going on around us. It's one of the things that before we got the SIP standards in place was we were very siloed in informational sharing. And even so in the operations side, the 2011 Southwest blackout, one of the big deals is we weren't sharing data, right? Um, so being able to report up things that are going on so that we can see you know, consolidated, coordinated attacks on, on our grid is really important. So awareness, training, and letting people know what to look for, um, having the fundamental uh, programs, uh, you know, around firewalls and um, change management and patching and all these different things is just so essential to, to SIP security. I think that that is really some of the wins that we've had because uh, you can sit down at a table now and talk to people and they've heard of, of, you know, patching software. They've heard of baselines, you know, and keeping track of. And they, they understand now that to protect something, you have to inventory. You have to know what you have before you can put a program in to protect it, right? 
I think that we've come a long way as, as an industry in 20 years there. There's nobody in our industry that you can talk to that, that has not heard of the SIP standards and, and, yeah. and has not gone through at least a certain level of SIP training. And so that they understand you know, all of the, the challenges and that the hackers are, are really serious about what they're doing. You know, there is some great things that's happened. I just think that it's, it's uh, you know, it's the maturity and sustainability aspect that we're talking about here. Yeah. And I would like to add that it's, it's actually been adopted in a lot of places around the world already. So it's yes. not just moved our, our needle, right? It didn't just get our country and our North America at least aware. It also, it, it's now finding its way into like all over South America and, and even parts of Asia. Europe discusses it, but it's at least kind of held up as that, you know, that initial thing that worked well for the electric sector, right? So, you know, in terms of accomplishments, it's done some great things. And like I say, it really definitely was the right thing at the time and it moved the needle um, for us. But it's, uh, I'd like look back at um, all the things that my, my organization, when I was at the utility, had to change, you know, just to accommodate the standards. And when I looked at it as a security professional, I thought, oh, this is, this is a low bar. I mean, there's, 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 I've been to high security environments that do way more than this, right? But just getting all of that implemented across the board at a big utility was an absolute mountain to move. Absolutely. Um, but it did. We moved it. And that, that's, that was the, you know, it, like you say, it got everyone's attention. It made everyone aware. And everyone likes to you know, argue about the language and the terms and the definitions, but we now all use those definitions. You know, that's, our, that's our playbook, right? We all talk with that speak and that language, and we all mean the same thing when we say those words now, where beforehand it was much more confusing. So I, I do think right. it's done a lot of really good things in its 20 years as well. So it, it deserves like a, a big birthday cake for 20 years and a send-off. <laughs> Absolutely. And wouldn't you agree that it's moved the needle on risk? I think that uh, our industry has adopted uh, cyber and physical security as part of the enterprise risk portfolio. I, I look back 20 years. I mean, we saw it as a risk, but you know, it was you know, it was really something that we didn't pay a lot of attention to. Um, it is now really you know understood that hey, this is a serious risk. It's not only a compliance risk, but it's an enterprise risk. It's a financial risk, right? So, uh, and one of my big conversations that I have with uh, clients when we're building compliance programs uh, around whether it be uh, op and planning or, or cybersecurity is, hey, you know, we can practice risk management or we can practice crisis management. And crisis management is more expensive in the long run, right? So yeah. I really think that the SIP standards and just that awareness piece again has moved cyber and physical security. Of course, it took some other things like the Medcalf shooting and, and different things, you know, uh, that you know kept bringing it forward and bringing it forward. But executives now see this as part of the enterprise risk management portfolio. They pay attention to it. They put money and budgeting towards it. Yeah. And so yeah. if you look at a, a positive that uh, the SIP standard profile and the NERC standards for that matter has done, it, it really has matured the, the risk profiles across the energy sector, in my opinion. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, we even see the conversations happening at the state, like within their oak, right? The regulatory utility commissions in each state, uh, they all use it as well. You know, it's it's a kind of their, their measure or measure of effectiveness. And you know, there's even been some blanket resolutions from NARUC that says, hey, if it's if you need it for security or for regulatory components in addition to security, uh, by all means, you know, the money's there. I think it has really brought the conversation forward at that level where it's not just a bunch of you know, hair on fire technicians running around trying to secure things. It actually gets it gets a line item in the budget, and it's talked about at the committee level, at the board, and the executives know what those words know what those words mean. So I agree, and they they pay attention to that, that regulatory world, right? Where before they you know they knew it was there, but they didn't really pay much attention to it. I think it's it's higher on that radar. Yeah, for sure. yeah I agree. Well, awesome conversation, Earl. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's yeah, let's go do another twenty years. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to believe we've been doing this twenty years though. I mean, it it really, is. Yeah, I, I had a lot. I had a lot more hair and a lot less gray back when it started. <laughs> <laughs> I had a red beard, I think, when I started. This. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, great it's to talk to you. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone.